Good afternoon and welcome everyone. Uh, I'm very excited. This is our first uh, Dean's Lecture to the Graduating Class. And what we're going to do is, uh, in the years moving forward, uh, beginning with this year, have a leading member of the bench or the bar uh, talk to the graduating class about their insights based on their career, about things that you should know as you're starting out and graduating from law school. Uh, and we could not have a better inaugural lecturer uh, than Justice Elena Kagan. So welcome to Georgetown. Thank you, Dean. No, it's a, thank you. It's really a pleasure to be here. And you know, I sort of thought today was going to be a snow day. <laughs> so I guess I'm glad you didn't cancel. That's well. <laughs> Well, today is a snow day, uh, and so I, I want to particularly thank the Justice for coming here. Uh, the federal government is closed today. Uh, and so I was in my office. You were in your office. I was, I was ready for business. <laughs> so we thought uh, you know, the, uh, the law school was actually closed until 1. And I have to say, I was a little concerned that since the school was going to be closed for most of the day, uh, that we might not be uh, able to do you justice in terms of the crowd. But as I look around and I see every seat here Pretty in Hard Auditorium is filled, you're, you're clearly a great draw. So thank you for being here. Expectations are high. Expectations huh? are high. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so the idea behind this, uh, this, uh, you know, these lectures is to, you know, to reflect on your career and to offer people advice as they're starting I'm supposed uh, to be literature. wise today. You're is supposed to be wise. Yeah. A lot of pressure. Yeah. Um, for those, I, it's really unnecessary to uh, to run through your biography, but that's really a requirement for me. So very quickly, um, Justice Kagan, like a plurality of the Supreme Court, is from New York City, uh, a graduate of Hunter High School, uh, Princeton, Oxford, Harvard. Uh, clerked for two of the legends uh, of the uh, United States Judiciary, first Judge Mikva on the D.C. Court of Appeals, and then, of course, for uh, uh, Judge Marshall, Justice Marshall, rather. And uh, you then uh, worked briefly at Williams and Connolly, uh, went into teaching at the University of Chicago, uh, then left teaching to work in uh, the Clinton administration, first as associate counsel, uh, and then as a deputy assistant to the president, uh, then went to Harvard and uh, became dean from 2003 to 2009. And one of the reasons why uh, you know, I thought that it was really perfect that you be our inaugural speaker was in addition to having really a great career in academia and in public service, you're also someone who as an academic was really famous for being very focused on helping students. Uh, you know, really ranging from revising the curriculum at Harvard to free coffee, um, which I would love to emulate. So, <laughs> if there are any donors out there? <laughs> uh, and then, after being really one of the great deans of Harvard Law School, uh, of any law school, uh, in 2009, you were nominated for Solicitor General, became Solicitor General in 2009, and then in 2010, uh, you were named to the Supreme Court, uh, succeeding in, in Justice Stevens' uh, chair on the court. And so you've been on the court since 2010. So You're, you're, you're very kind, Dean Trainer. You know, it was, uh, when, when people used to go through my resume like that, I used to, uh, when they were introducing me if some, for something, I used to get up to the podium and say, well, now you know my secret, I can't keep a job. <laughs> but I think my new job has solved that, you know? So, so no longer. Well, very good. I'm, I'm relieved to hear that. <laughs> so now, so let's start, you know, again, uh, what I wanted to do is to have you offer advice to people. But let's start. When you were a kid, what was your first thoughts about what, what job you wanted to have when you grew up? You know, I'm not sure I remember all that well. I mean, I had my uh, you know, years when I was going to be a famous tennis player and stuff like that. Um, I was a voracious reader, so, uh, so I definitely thought I wanted, like being a writer seemed a good thing to me. Uh, being a lawyer honestly did not. So um, 
my father was a lawyer, mm -hmm. and when I, when I think about the kind of law my father practiced now, I very much understand why, uh, why he had so much fun in the profession and why it was so meaningful to him. But I have to say that as a kid, it did not seem all that exciting to me. Hmm. Um, you know, my, my colleague, Justice Sotomayor, talks about how when she was a kid, she watched Perry Basin. And this is, this is uh, you know, way before anybody in this room's time. But in Perry Mason was this great trial lawyer. And there were all these sort of aha moments when Perry Mason at trial solved the great case. And it was all very exciting. And, uh, and Justice Sotomayor talks about how watching that made her want to be a lawyer. And when she told me this, I said to her, oh, I knew practicing law was nothing like that, you know? <laughs> Um, because I saw my father go to work and come back every morning, and he never had those aha moments, you know? And in fact, my father did a kind of law where he thought it was a terrible failure when he went to court. Hmm. I mean, he had a small practice, sort of a small town practice in New York hmm. City. Small practice, just helped ordinary people, solved their problems, loved doing that, I think, found it deeply meaningful and valuable. Um, but I uh, always thought of, of when you got to court, it was because you had failed someplace along mm. the lines. And, uh, and you know, as I say now, I sort of look at what he did and think, what a meaningful way to spend your time in, in the profession. But as a kid, I thought it, it just it did not seem very exciting. So when did you think that you wanted to become a lawyer? Well, I never really did. <laughs> You know, I'm sure you were a dean, I was a dean. I spent so much time talking to prospective students and, uh, and telling them, now, don't go to law school just because you can't think of anything else to do. You know, because there are all these students, and it's like they get out of college, and they don't really know what else to do, and they think, well, I'll go to law school because it will keep my options open, right? And, uh, and, and for several years, I said this to all these students. And then I kind of realized, that's why I went to law school, you know? <laughs> so where did this advice come from, exactly? That, I mean, I did. I went to law, I, I went to law school. I, I, had, I had sort of thought in, I majored in history in college. I sort of thought about being an academic. By the time I got to the end of my undergraduate experience and having gone through a year of doing a senior thesis, which is a very big project uh, at, at at the college I went to, I thought, uh, there is no way I'm going to be a historian. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I, I really didn't know what I wanted to do. And I just sort of thought, I'll go to law school. I'll keep my options open. Something will turn up. And, uh, and, and that's why I went. But then instead, you know, I went to law school. And I fell into the lucky group where, really, from the first day, I, I just loved every mm -hmm. moment of it. And I thought, my gosh, what a lucky uh, thing that I, I ended up here. Hmm. And what did you like about law school? Well, I liked the combination of two things, I think. I liked that it was, uh, I, I, I liked just thinking about it intellectually. It's, uh, I liked the puzzle aspects of law. You know, um, I, I was like one of these law students who always liked the really technical classes, actually. I loved tax hmm. I, um, um, because, because I liked sort of thinking through really complicated problems. Uh, but I also liked the fact that it wasn't uh, purely a puzzle and purely abstract, that there were uh, ways that people could use the law to actually make a difference in the world. And so it seemed uh, very practical and grounded to me at the same time as it seemed intellectually fascinating. And uh, that's what I liked about it. Hmm. And then when you got out of, or as you were going through law school, did you have a sense of what you wanted to do next? You know, I, 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 I think I played with a lot of different possibilities. I remember I thought about being uh, an academic, and that was definitely something that uh, I, 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 you know, I contemplated. But I also had a professor who said, uh, you know, you've never really known anything but school. You should go out and get some, uh, uh, do some other things, get some other experiences before you decide you want to spend your life in an academic mm -hmm. environment. So I tried to do that. Uh, and uh, so, you know, I, I think, but I think, uh, you know, I, th I think I thought about academia. I thought about private practice. I suppose I knew that at some point in my professional life, uh, I would go into public service in some form. So I, I think I hoped to have, as, and I was lucky enough to have this ha actually happen to me, I think I hoped to have a career where I could experience a lot of different mm. things, do a lot of different things. 
uh, uh, during the course of my career. Um, you know, maybe because I have a short attention span, or, or maybe mm. just because I thought a lot of different things would probably be interesting. So, so I hoped to be a person who sort of bopped back and forth among among a number of different areas. So, you know, one of the things as people are starting out, that's a question is, kind of how do you think about your career? So, do you focus on just your first job? Do you focus on this is where I want to be in 30 years? What advice would you give to people as they're starting out? as they think about their career arc? Yeah, well, don't, definitely don't think about, I guess, just, just your first job. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I, think, I think try to be more holistic in your thinking about the kinds of experiences you want to have uh, and uh, the kinds of work you want to do during the, the, the whole course of your career. But then, but then also sort of understand that um, sometimes I think, uh, and that, just saying that, it sounds like you should plan every step of the way. And I really don't think that. I actually think that law students tend to plan too much, mm -hmm. or at least I don't want this to be a kind of anti-plan, like you should never plan for anything, because you should sort of think about what matters to you and think about the different kinds of experiences you want to have, but realize that they're just not all going to happen in the order you think or in the order you want, that uh, different things are going to sort of randomly and serendipitously present themselves to you. And I think actually the people who have the most fun legal careers are the people who are very open to serendipity in their lives hmm. and who, um, who you know, will be doing one thing and sort of thinking that that's what they're going to do for a number of years. And then, but then we'll see an opportunity and we'll seize that opportunity rather than say, oh, I'm sorry, this doesn't exactly fit into, into the plan that I have. And you know, I'm going to wait for that for you know, another X number of years or that's not quite right. Hmm. But just people who, because I think a lot of life is, is sort of uh, luck and opportunities presenting themselves in ways that you might not think that they would. And uh, the people who end up, I think, with the great legal careers mm. are the people who just sort of you know, grab the things when they come. Mm. And is that, was that with your career? Is that how it was structured? You know, I think I was lucky enough to do that. I mean, mm -hmm. I think uh, if, if you said to me, uh, you know, what what was planned, uh, I, you know, almost nothing was actually. That, you know, just different things presented themselves at, at uh, different points in time, and I was sort of uh, lucky enough, or maybe I knew enough to sort of grab, grab good things when they came up. Hmm. Now, and you started by clerking. Yeah. So is that something that you? Well, it was a great experience, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, yeah, yeah, I loved it. I hope, I hope the clerks that I have love it. Um, uh, you know, if you like law, it's a, it's a, it's, it's, it's just a wonderful place to, to think about law for a little longer, but also to see it in action. Mm -hmm. And uh, a judge can be a great mentor, of course, uh, if you're lucky enough to get the right one. And uh, I was, I was lucky enough to get two great mentors and two sort of miraculous human beings, and to, and to sort of um, just uh, see them in action, which was an uh, unbelievable experience for a young person, and uh, so you know, for me, it was it was a it was a great opportunity. And what did you learn from them? Well, all kinds of different things. Uh, you know, first, I I I, uh, I think I probably uh, learned something just about the the various kinds of non-legal qualities and attributes that people. Uh, that, that people have. Judge Mikva was one of the world's most generous men. Um, uh, and, you know, going through a year with somebody who had that sort of uh, deep in his bones, generosity and actually sort of love for people uh, mm -hmm. was a great experience for me. Uh, I mean, just, Justice Marshall, of course, is an iconic figure. Uh, one of, um, and, 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 and that was, you know, one of the great experiences of my life. He was, Justice Marshall, by the time I clerked for him, was, uh, was relatively elderly and was uh, uh, a little bit, uh, you know, he, he was turned 80, but he was a little bit of an old 80, and he was sort of looking back on his life at that point. And, uh, and the clerks were, uh, you know, lucky enough to be there with him at a time when he was really thinking about his life and what he had accomplished. And, mm. and, uh, uh, and he was the world's greatest storyteller and raconteur. And you would walk into his office, and first you would talk about the cases, and you would do all your work. 
And then at a certain time, he would just sort of flip over and start telling stories. Hmm. And, uh, you know, they were unbelievable stories because they were stories about uh, some of the most important aspects of 20th century American history. And, you know, there you were, hmm. you were there listening to this man who I believe was the finest lawyer of the 20th century, uh, uh, you know, tell about uh, his cases and the way he approached his cases and the decisions he made and the difficulties he confronted, the dangers he faced, including the physical dangers. It was, it was an unbelievable uh, ex experience. It must have been incredibly inspiring working for him. It was incredibly inspiring. I mean, uh, if you're not inspired after a year of clerking for Thurgood Marshall, you're a little bit dead to the world, honestly. <laughs> uh, uh, but, you know, I mean, it was sort of a lesson in what law can accomplish. I mean, the reason I think he is the greatest 20th century American lawyer, I mean, he had all these incredible skills, and, and I don't think there was anybody who combined what he did in appellate courts with what he did in trial courts and, and all of that. But, but just, look, if you're going to measure a person by, by uh, the, the, the degree to which they promote justice in the world, mm -hmm. which is, I think, one important way to measure lives and law, uh, you know, I, I don't think that there was anybody who, who really, uh, uh, you know, uh, approaches him in that. Yeah, I think that's right. And so did that, you know, having the privilege of working for Justice Marshall, did that shape your career at all and, you know, affect the decisions that you made? Well, I think uh, both he and Judge Mikva were good sort of lessons in thinking ab about, um, you know, just uh, uh, leading lives in the law that were not just about you, mm -hmm. that were um, about the way in which uh, you could help people and make a difference in the world. And for, you know, for every individual, uh, that's going to mean a different thing, different. Uh, uh, but, but I think I think uh, there there are very few people who have uh, really deep, fulfilling, meaningful uh, legal careers without finding some way uh, to 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 make a difference. Uh, you know, to 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 things a little bit, you know, bigger than themselves. Mm -hmm. Now, how important are mentors for a lawyer? Well, they've been really important in my life, and mm -hmm. I've been lucky enough to have them sort of every place I went. I mean, I had them in law school, and I had them, you know, these, uh, the two men I clerked for, and I had them when I was a young academic and when I was uh, a young lawyer in practice. And, uh, uh, you know, I mean, just each step of the way, people to learn from, Mm -hmm. And and also people, uh, y y you know, who m make the next step and the next step and the next step a little bit easier. I mean, one of one of the things I did a few years after clerking was I went to the University of Chicago mm -hmm. uh, to to teach. Well, why did I get a job at the University of Chicago? Well, you know, partly it was you know my resume and my transcript and all of that stuff, but partly it was. Uh, uh, Judge Mikva knew everybody in Chicago, hmm. and Judge Mikva called. On, called you know, he had gone to the University of Chicago. He had very deep and close connections there, and uh, you know he picked up the phone and hmm. uh, talked to some people about me. And um, uh, you know I could say that about sort of everything I've gotten in my life. And honestly, I think most people can. That um, that you know it's partly because of the hard work that you've put in and because of what you've accomplished, but it's, a, it's, it's partly because there are you know, other people whom you've run into along the way who were there to do a good turn for you. Mm -hmm. And you hope that you'll be there to do a good turn for somebody else. But, um, uh, you know, uh, I mean, sort of said that way, it can seem very self-serving, like go find mentors so that they can help you. But, you know, in truth, uh, we all help each other. And uh, uh, thinking about, thinking as you go through, especially the early years of a legal career, the people you're connecting with and, and, um, and, and uh, you know, how you can learn from them, but also thinking a little bit about um, how they can help you make your way, I think is a pretty valuable thing. I mean, I think, you know, that's, I think that's a very important point. You know, particularly when people start law school, the reason why everybody gets admitted to Georgetown, they're incredibly smart. They did very, very well academically. And so there's a, a tendency to focus on just kind of pure intelligence as the key to success in a career. But 
you know, finding mentors, people you can learn from. Including, by the way, your peers. Mm -hmm. uh, so I used to think about this when I was dean at the law school because, uh, as you just said, I think a lot of people come to law school and they're very good students and they continue to really focus on that part. And of course you should, you should, you know, uh, uh, you, you know work hard. But um, I always felt that when you looked at the law school and everybody just sort of putting their heads in a book, and then you compared to what went on at the business school, mm -hmm. where everybody was really focused on making connections. And there's something a little bit like icky about like <laughs> all this focus on just you know making connections so that you know uh, 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 you know you can help this person and that person can help you. But there's something that's uh, that's great about it. It sort of acknowledges that you know, you're not going to be just an individual in your legal career. You're going to be part of teams, part of institutions, part of collectives. And, um, uh, and the connections you make with all the people that you work with, all the people you study mm -hmm. with when you're a student, are um, uh, you know, of, of really deep significance in somebody's career. And they're also, you know, they're also personally very affirming. Absolutely. Um, I mean, one of the things that, that you've done also in your career that I find really striking is promoting collegiality and encouraging people to work together. Uh, I mean, I think that, you know, when I look back at what you did at Harvard Law School, you know, what you did was you really made the faculty, at least from the outside, feel like a community in a way in which it hadn't before. Um, and certainly a lot of the, the press accounts, you know, indicate that uh, that the trajectory you're on in the court, you know, is similarly about team building in a way that, uh, you know, when I think about justices across history who've really been about getting people to, you know, think together, Chief Justice Warren, uh, Justice Brennan. Now, that's something that we don't normally teach in law school. You know, how did you, how do you, how do you learn to get people to work together, and and, and how do you build teams? Well, um, I, I, I make no claims for anything on the court. You know, I'm still very young there. I'm still pretty new, and uh, I'm still um, uh, finding my way. I'm sure, but um, but I I did take some degree of pride in this at 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 the law school, and and uh, you're extraordinary at it, uh, Dean Trainer. Um, and I think it's part of what makes a good dean, uh, is, um, is uh, listening to people and, and getting them to focus on uh, the institution as a whole and how they can contribute to the institution as a whole and how they can work together with other people uh, rather than just sort of go their separate mm -hmm. way or even worse, fight with everybody, which was often the case at, 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 at Harvard in, uh, in um, uh, some parts of its history. Um, but, uh, you, know, uh, you know, I love thinking actually about institutions and how they operate, how they work, and how you can get people to work together in them and, uh, and uh, make, make them succeed in ways that you didn't think you could. And it's a little bit trial and error, and I think I really did have to, I don't think it came very naturally to me. I think it was something that I had to, to learn and think hard about. Um, uh, I think it involves uh, really listening to other people um, and uh, you know, doing a lot more listening than, than talking often um, in order to exercise leadership and in order to move an institution. Um, but, uh, but it's, you, you know, if there was anything that I was proud of at Harvard probably other than the free coffee, <laughs> which, you know, I recommend you get that donor for. That, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it was probably that. Now, it's, it really was remarkable. You know, at, at Harvard, you know, it, it seemed like there was a period in which the faculty was really deadlocked. And so there was no, really very little new faculty hiring. And then you came in and really transformed the law school in a very short period of time. And there was a, a curricular reform, uh, a tremendous wave of faculty hiring. Is there anything specific that, you know, that, that people can think about listening um, trying to get people to to see across differences. Uh, you know, uh, listening, trying to get people to see across differences, p picking out people who will help you, 
um, because you can't do it on your own, so you need people who are going to sort of join in to this endeavor with you and, and, and help you achieve it, and I was lucky enough to have a bunch of great people doing that. Um, just trying to figure out, you know, some people uh, are, are uh, just sort of trying to figure out what makes an institution click, what makes it work, the personal dynamics within an institution, and uh, you know, using that knowledge to figure out how you can move and change and shift a place. I mean, it's a little bit different, uh, but one of the things that you did that I find very striking is uh, the concern that the Senate had about you know, the fact that you had no knowledge of hunting and guns, <laughs> uh, and the way you responded to that. I think is reflective. You want me to tell this story? I think it's a great story. <laughs> I have to say there were several people when I was talking to people before about what they wanted to hear. A number of people wanted to hear the hunting story. Okay. <laughs> they, they haven't heard the hunting story already? It sort of feels like, it's you know. A couple have, but I think everybody <laughs> should. Well, uh, the thing you have to understand is that when you go through the Senate confirmation, at least for me, you know, as, uh, somebody who was nominated by a Democratic president who had worked in the Domestic Policy Council of another Democratic president on some initiatives that involved gun control. And uh, look, you know, I grew up in New York City. We didn't go hunting on the weekends there, you know. <laughs> it was discouraged. It was, yeah. <laughs> we, went, we went to the ballet, you know. Uh, and uh, uh, so I, I, did, I did not, I, I, but everybody's very concerned in the Senate, Democrats and Republicans alike, about Second Amendment issues. And so as I would go from office to office, everybody, you know, everybody thinks, oh, the hot issues, the ones you're going to be asked about by everybody are like abortion. I have to say, Second Amendment guns uh, totally eclipsed everything else combined. And I, I didn't have all that much to say. You can't talk about these substantively, you can't say I'm going to rule this way or I'm going to rule that way. And as people would ask me, like, well, have you ever hunted? Do you, have, have you, do you know anybody who hunts? <laughs> do you own a gun? Have you ever touched a gun? <laughs> have you ever seen a gun, you know? Uh, my answers were actually pretty, pretty uh, poor in, on this front. And uh, so, so I was once, uh, it was uh, late in the day. I had been through a lot of these interviews. I was a little bit tired of them, to tell you the truth. I was sitting with one of the senators from Idaho. He started asking me these questions and telling me, uh, as is appropriate, uh, how, you know, uh, for many of his constituents, uh, hunting was an extraordinarily important activity, part of the culture and how he uh, you know, didn't have any confidence that I would understand this in the way I thought about uh, these issues. And I said to him, I said, you know, Senator, I said, uh, you know, I've never had an opportunity to go hunting. It's just you know, not where, I've, uh, where I grew up and what, what, I've, what I've, but I said, uh, Senator, if you would like to invite me hunting, because he had been talking about his ranch and what he hunted <laughs> on his ranch. I said, if you would invite, like to invite me hunting, I would really be glad to go. And this look of abject horror passed, <laughs> passed across his face, you know? And uh, I realized, okay, I probably went a little bit too far. And uh, I, said, I said, I'm sorry, I didn't really mean to go that far. I said, but I'll tell you what, Senator, I'll make you this promise that if I'm lucky enough to be confirmed, I'll ask Justice Scalia to take me hunting because I knew that Justice Scalia was a great hunter and a lover of hunting. And uh, when I got to the court, I uh, really one of the, in, in the first summer, I, I, I went to Justice Scalia and I told him the story. And I said, so I said, this is the f only promise that I made in 82 <laughs> courtesy visits, you know? <laughs> so are you going to help me fulfill this promise? And he loved it. He thought it was hilarious. He was laughing, laughing, laughing. And uh, so he said, all right. so." So first he took me to, he, he's a member of a gun club out in Virginia. He took me to his gun club with uh, one of his sons-in-law who was a great shooter and we, he taught me to shoot. And uh, then we shot some birds. We went, we, he has this group of buddies. He goes quail shooting and pheasant shooting with. So we did that a few times. And then at the end of the year, he said, all right, it's time to do big game. <laughs> so, uh, we each got ourselves a deer license and an antelope license. 
We went out to Wyoming together. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Uh, I shot a deer. We could not find any antelope. And according to him, we found the wrong kind of deer. He says that the deer that I shot, I could have gotten in his backyard. <laughs> but you know, it seemed like a deer to me. <laughs> so, uh, and next, next year he's taking me turkey shooting, which he says is the best kind of hunting. So it turns out it's sort of fun, actually, you know? <laughs> but I don't know, was that story supposed to show anything? It's such a good story, it doesn't really matter. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, but I think the, uh, the reason why... Yeah, uh, okay. No, because I think it reflects the idea of kind of getting to understand whether, pe whether people are. You know, so the senator's question about guns. I mean, you know, I'm from the New York metropolitan area. That's not what we did. Uh, and, you know, I, you know, I have to say, it's like when uh, my family's here, when we had a family vacation last year and we were driving through the Southwest, you just get a sense it's, you know, very different. You're all kind of <coughs> all alone, you know, and it's just, it's a different conception of, you know, why you would have guns. It's just so, you know, the ability to kind of get into other people's perspectives I think is something that uh, you seem able to, to do. Well, I hope so. I mean, because uh, everybody has different experiences and the ability to sort of learn from everybody else's experiences as well as from your... <laughs> Just can't take you anywhere, can you? <laughs> that's, that's one of the takeaway points of today. <laughs> So, um, so another question. Um, you really, you're such a terrific writer, and I have to say, I love. I'm going to come back. You keep on, you know, telling me all the all the things I'm good at. I can tell you all the things I'm not so good at. You know. Now you really, I have to say, your opinions are really a joy to read, and uh, and I think they're just, you know, they're different from anyone else's on the court, uh, and so. You know, one of the things that as graduates are going to be doing is they're going to be writing in a range of different contexts. And I wanted to see if you had any advice for them as, as writers. Uh, well, mostly it's to work hard at your writing and to try to find your voice. Because uh, it, for me, it took many, many years. I mean, if, if uh, I thank you for saying the nice things about my writing, I'm sure I can get to be a better writer. And the reason I'm sure of that is because I have gotten to be a better writer, is that you know, if I look back at the writing that I did when I was in law school, I think you know, I didn't write the same way that I do now. And uh, partly, I've just gotten to be a better writer. And partly, I've found uh, a kind of distinctive and individual voice, which actually, I think, if I had tried at the age of 27, mm -hmm. Uh, I don't, I don't, you know, I probably shouldn't have tried at the age of 27. Mm -hmm. So, uh, uh, but I do think that writing well, for most people, takes enormous amounts of hard work. I mean, I think that the number of people who can sit down and produce perfect paragraphs in an instant are like, I've never met them. Mm -hmm. I mean, maybe there's one or two. Um, uh, including maybe there's one or two of the people I work with now. but. But I think for most people, and even most really great writers, uh, they are great because they spend the time that it takes to produce great writing, which is a lot of time, which is you know staring at a paragraph and just asking yourself over and over uh, how to make that paragraph better. And uh, uh, so, so I think writing matters. I think writing matters a, a terrific amount in the law, uh, certainly if you're going to be an appellate lawyer. That's mostly the way we decide our cases. You know, we do all this argument stuff, but it's a little bit for show mm -hmm. that really the most important thing is to write us a good brief. And, um, uh, and, some, and some people are, are better at it than others. And I do think that part of the reason some people are better at it than others is that some people just understand that you have to work and work and work and work at it. And that there's no such thing as turning in the first draft. But, but you're, you also have, you have a really distinctive voice. I mean, I think your, uh, your opinions, you know, if you read your opinion, you're not saying, oh, this, this is Justice Scalia's or this is Justice Kennedy. It's distinctively yours. You know, how did you, how did you come up with that voice? And again, you're, um, you know, this, 
you know, it's not that you were a judge before and that you had involved a voice while you were an appellate court judge. How did you come up with the voice that you have on the court? I mean, I, I think in some sense, I think Justice Scalia has a distinctive voice. I think Justice, you know, going through history, Justice Holmes, Justice Jackson. But it's really, it's unusual to have such a distinctive voice. Although, uh, you know, I'm not sure exactly how unusual it is. I mean, I suspect that if you gave me a whole pile of opinions, mm -hmm. but without with the names crossed off of them, um, but knowing that they were all produced by members of the court now, mm -hmm. I, I suspect I could do pretty well mm -hmm. in, in, uh, in saying which was whose. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so I'm not sure quite, I, I don't think it's quite as unusual as you're saying, but um, I don't know. I th I'll tell you the way I write an opinion and what I, uh, 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 which has a lot to do with my being a teacher, is I sort of think about writing opinions in the way I used to think about teaching classes. In other words, I used to sort of sit down at my computer and I used to say, all right, how am I going to explain this really complicated body of law to a bunch of people bunch of first years or even third years who don't know all that mm -hmm. much. Um, and, uh, and law is complicated. And the ability to explain law clearly and succinctly and well in ways that people understand at the moment, and then even more than that, in ways that people um, remember, so in mm -hmm. ways that stick with people, is a really, uh, it's, it's one of the great challenges of teaching. And so I used to sort of sit down and sort of think about, okay, so first I say this, and then I say this, and you know, how to order the, all the different points to really get people to see uh, uh, your, the, the, the logic of mm -hmm, something, mm -hmm. and, um, and how to use analogies and uh, examples to give people a sense of uh, uh, you know, why the reasoning goes the way it does. And that's what I do now, too. I mean, I basically do the same thing that I used to do when I was preparing to teach a class, trying to figure out how to explain something mm -hmm. to a group of people who didn't know about it, and trying to explain it in a way that would be sticky, that would really uh, sit in their heads, mm -hmm. that I kind of do the same thing now when I plot out an opinion. Mm -hmm. And then how do you use the clerks? Well, um, you know, the uh, clerks are really important, but I, I you, you, you know, honestly, the, so it's a little bit frustrating to be a clerk for me, to tell you the truth. And the, re the way it's frustrating is I do ask them to write first drafts, so I'm not, you know, some, some judges, a few judges, just, just say, look, it's going to be my stuff, and so I'm just going to sit down and write my stuff. So I ask the clerks to write a first draft, and the reason I say it's a little bit frustrated is because I tell them, I'm going to ask you to write a first draft, and then you're not going to see a single word of it <laughs> in the opinion that I produce. But for me, it's helpful. For me, it's helpful to look at the way somebody else thinks through a topic, even if it's really like, well, I sort of see why they did that, but like, what's the point? <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, but, but, it's, but it's helpful for me to use as a launching pad. I sort of look at a draft and I see what ideas work and what ideas don't work, hmm. what, what uh, I, I, you know, I think about the, 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 the organization or the progression of arguments that they've used, the things that they've picked to talk about and to respond to. And for me, it gives me a kind of launch pad to, uh, to think through a case on my own. But then, uh, for me, and I think that there are two reasons for this. I mean, the first is just, you know, I'm one of these people that don't know what they think until they uh, see what they say. You know, that for me, the sort of writing through a problem is the way I learn a problem. And I, uh, countless times, pretty much every time, uh, in the writing, I discover all kinds of things I didn't know and would never have learned about an issue unless I had really started from scratch. And then the second thing is I do want, if you say my opinions sound like me, that's mm -hmm. a good thing. I mm -hmm. want my opinions to sound like me. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, so it's important for, for me to have you know, my own voice, and, uh, and that's another reason why I start from scratch. But, uh, but they do, they, you know, they help me, the drafts help me to think about something. They, they, uh, they sort of provide a launch pad for me. Uh, they obviously, you know, give me a lot of, you know, the citations and things mm -hmm. like that that I can use. Uh, and, uh, and then what I do, that where my clerks are unbelievably important, is that I give it back to them. 
you know, I say, here, okay, so here's my take. And I, I encourage them to edit me really super hard. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, clerks, sometimes they start out, they're a little bit nervous about doing this. You're a Supreme Court justice, they're not. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but I really, I, I mean, to me, the value of a clerk is in how hard she edits me. Hmm. Um, because nobody writes perfectly the first time out. Hmm. And even, you know, I write slowly, but even by the end, I, you know, I write slowly and very deliberately and I think about everything. But even then, by the end, there are so many things that can be improved on. And uh, so I give it back to my clerks. And first, the one who gave me the draft, and then she'll do an edit, and uh, I'll turn it around again. And then I give it to my other three as well. And those people, probably don't know the subject matter quite as well. So they come at it with a little bit fresh eyes and a little bit the way a normal reader would come mm. at it. And uh, all three of them edit it. And then I ask the sort of principal clerk on the case essentially to compile all three other edits and to give me her take on which things to do and which things mm -hmm. not to do. But for, you know, from very small things, change a word, to big things. You know, this argument really doesn't work. Go rethink it, hmm. uh, and hmm. uh, uh, you know that's that's the most important part of the process for me. And then on the other end, you talked a little bit about the significance of the briefs. What's the key to an effective brief? Well, clarity for sure, I'm, and the worst kind of brief is a is a brief that you have to struggle when you're reading it. Like, what's the point here? I don't get it. Um, so you want something that's crystal clear. Uh, and, 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 and then, you know, I think the ability to speak in kind of commonsensical terms, say, here's what's at issue, here's why you should care about this, here's why this has got to be the right answer, um, and, uh, and the ability to sort of put it all together, to speak thematically. I mean, there's obviously going to be a lot of micro points you have mm -hmm. to make along the way, but to have uh, a single theory of the case and to have that theory uh, appeal to somebody's sort of base common sense hmm. um, about how this, this has got to be the right answer if the law is going to make any sense. So it's, real, it's not just about kind of saying this is the way the precedent lines up. It's you you it know, it's, it's partly that, mm -hmm. and I'm sure it's more that in lower courts. But, mm -hmm. you know, one of the things about the Supreme Court is that as, 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 as as people often learn when they stand at the podium and they say, well, the Sixth Circuit said, and somebody's going to say, why do we care about what the Sixth Circuit mm -hmm. said? You know, we really only care about what we said. And, <laughs> and sometimes we don't even care about that all that much, you know? So, and what, what makes something appealing in terms of common sense? I mean, I realize uh, that's kind that's, of an that's open That's too question. hard to do, because I think it's just, it's, it's yeah. very case specific. Now, what about appellate, uh, what about oral arguments? So what makes a good oral argument? Um, well, uh, you know, somebody who, uh, I, th I think some of it is the same. It's the ability to know the three points you really want the court to get, to be able to have picked those three points, but, uh, and to leave the court with that sense, like I'm not leaving this podium until you absolutely know these three things about my case, which is, go which is going to make you think that of course I have to win. But, um, but you have to be able to do that and at the same time have a conversation with the court about whatever the court wants to have a conversation about. And uh, so the person who just is hammering home his three points is not nearly as effective as somebody who manages to convey them, but, uh, but also completely engages with the justices on what their questions are. And the most effective people are people who do that in a very uh, natural and relaxed kind of way. We are really having a conversation, mm -hmm. um, uh, but who, who are very good listeners, who completely understand what a justice is getting at mm -hmm. in uh, his or her question. And, uh, and, and, and respond to it very quickly. And you have to be quick at the Supreme Court because uh, most of us ask a lot of questions and so somebody will get up there at the podium and it'll be sort of rat a tat a tat a tat You know, there's like, basically you only have two or three sentences to answer any given question. So you can't be the kind of person who spends a while clearing her throat, you know, before you get to the main point. You gotta have the main point really on the tip of your tongue. 
And that involves an extraordinary amount of preparation, right? And I guess, you know, if I, if I sound like I, I, I talk a lot, whether it's about writing or oral advocacy or whatever about, you just, you know, you have to work at it. And it's the same thing here. I mean, the people who are great, who come to the court, are people who you know have just spent hours and hours and hours thinking about every single question uh, that's going to be thrown at them and thinking about what the two-sentence way to answer each of those questions is. So thinking through kind of every angle of the case, every possible question. Every what possible your question, the, 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 the answer you're going to make to that question. And we're really lucky. I mean, we have an extraordinary number of, of great lawyers who appear before us. And they all have different styles. You know, there's no single style that, uh, that I was once on a plane with really two of the greats the now Judge Srinivasan and Paul Clement. Mm -hmm. And we were all together at one of a, a, the Sixth Circuit Conference and our plane was delayed. We were all in, in each other's company for many hours at the airport. And, uh, and we were talking about different argument styles. And, and um, Paul Clement said that uh, uh, Sri Srinivasan, uh, he, he, he said there were, there were people who, um, who heat up the, the room from a podium and people who cool it down. And Paul said he was a heater-upper, which he sort of is, that there's a kind of tremendous energy that comes when Paul Clement steps to the podium, a kind of just like a, he's a very mesmerizing speaker, and there's a sort of energy in the room. And then Judge Srinivasan, when he used to argue, he's like, uh, you know, he calms it down. He's like, everybody's reasonable man. Hmm. How could you? <laughs> How could you possibly disagree with what I'm saying in such a calm and cool <laughs> way, you know? Um, and they're both just tremendous, but you know, very different in style. And probably those styles reflect their personalities. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so you can't turn yourself into a person you're not. But, um, but you don't have to, because there are lots of different ways to be great. And how important is oral argument? It's not all that important to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's, uh, sometimes it is. It's not that it never decides a case. Sometimes it does. Sometimes I'll go in, and I really will be on a knife's edge. Um, and sometimes I'll, I'll have a lean, but you can get me off that lean. Mm -hmm. And I'll walk out of argument, and I'll go back to my clerks, and I'll say, wow, I, you know, I was thinking X, but mm -hmm. now I'm kind of thinking Y, because Y sure sounded a lot better than X. Mm. Um, but you know, honestly, if um, uh, I think for most people, most of the time, the real work of thinking through a case happens when you read the briefs, not when you're listening to the argument. And um, partly the argument has an entirely different function, which is that it gives us an opportunity to talk with each other. So we don't talk with each other about a case hmm. uh, before argument. Argument is our first opportunity, really, to uh, you know, convey to your colleagues what you're thinking about something. And, and that can be quite important, actually. Mm. We, when we go to conference, we go around the room in seniority order. And uh, that means that I always speak ninth. Mm. And everybody else will have both spoken and cast a preliminary vote before the time I get to speak. And there's some very good things about speaking ninth. It's definitely a lot better than eighth or seventh, you know. but. But, but the one bad thing is, I mean, there are a lot of votes cast before you ever get to say anything, right? And, and, and so for me, if there's a sort of distinctive take I have on a case or something that I really want my colleagues uh, to think about that I think, for whatever reason, they might not have focused on, uh, I'll try to use argument hmm. as, a, as uh, my opportunity to do that. Hmm. So you bring out a certain angle on the case that you think is relevant to the case. Sometimes. I mean, not every time. Sometimes I'm asking questions because I really want to know the answers to them, mm -hmm. you know? But, um, but, sometimes, but sometimes I am asking questions to try to convey certain points to my colleagues. And I think all of us uh, do that to some degree. Would it be better, and I realize it's not the tradition, but would it be better if people talked before the oral argument, or is this a better structure? Well, uh, I, I, I can see why it might be. So, uh, 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 you know, I think it can work either way. Now, um, just to, to flip to another topic, the, you know, one of the things that's, again, very striking about your career, you know, you, you've talked about being open to different opportunities and that it makes sense. 
to be open rather than to say, well, this is what I'm going to do at 35, and this is what I'm going to do at 50. And you've had kind of a series of you know, very important jobs, you know, very high stakes. You know, how do you prepare for them? You know, you dean of the law school or solicitor general or justice of the Supreme Court. How do you prepare for these new challenges? Uh, well, you talk to people about what's involved in, in any of them. And, uh, and you know you're not going to get it right the first day out. Um, but uh, you know, the Solicitor General, that's actually a, 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 a good example. Because when I was made Solicitor General, I had never argued a case in front of the Supreme Court. Mm. In fact, I had never argued a case before any appellate court. And if you ask me the moment in my life when I was most nervous and most uh, insecure about whether I was going to have the necessary, uh, uh, you know, everything that was necessary to really succeed in a job, I would say it was that job. Um, and, uh, and I just talked to an enormous number of people. I talked to pretty much every living Solicitor General, all hmm. of whom were incredibly generous with their time who talked to me about how the office worked, the kinds, uh, uh, a lot of different things that have nothing to do with actually arguing the cases, but, uh, but that go into being a successful Solicitor General, and who also talked to me about arguing. And then in terms of my, uh, my arguments, I spent a lot of time uh, with my colleagues, especially uh, my first argument was Citizens United. Mm. It's kind of a big argument. <laughs> it's the re-argument of Citizens United. The only, the only, the only uh, saving grace was that everybody said, "Well, you know, you're going to lose." So, you know, what? Because, uh, you know, in in ordering re-argument, the court had sort of signaled which way it was going to go. So, I didn't, I didn't really quite think that all of campaign finance was resting on me. I pretty, I'm, I pretty much thought the argument was not going to have a whole lot to do with this case. But still. Uh, but still, it was important, and I knew that everybody was going to be focused on it, and it was important uh, not to fall on my face. I spent an enormous amount of time with uh, all the deputy solicitors general, you know, who have this in, uh, just incredible uh, experience. Mm -hmm. you know, each of them has done 75 or 100 oral arguments themselves, and with some of the assistants uh, as well, to talk about what they thought made for a successful argument uh, in, in, in the court talked about arguing generally, talked about uh, the case in, in particular. So, you know, I think uh, when you go into something that's completely new to you, I think just sort of reaching out to all, mm -hmm. all these people who, uh, you know, know a lot better what's involved and um, uh, not being afraid to, to, to say, you know, help me uh, mm. is, a, is a really important thing. And before you became a justice on the court, did you talk to four other justices or? You know, how do you prepare? That's such a, it's a unique job. How yeah. do you prepare for it? Well, you know, a little bit less so, actually. I mean, one of the things that struck me was that when I got on the court, uh, I, was, I was struck by the fact that uh, I think all my colleagues, it was like, no, now you're just one of us. There's no, I mean, some, in some ways, the court is very seniority focused, that we do everything in order of seniority. But in some ways, from the day you get on, everybody just sort of assumes Hey, you know, you know as much as I know, and uh, uh, you know that's quite clearly not so. But <laughs> but it's actually a really uh, lovely part of the institution that everybody treats you from the very first moment that you're there as a full equal uh, member of the institution, mm -hmm. and and sort of pretends that you know as much as they do, uh, and. And to the extent that you go in and you like ask somebody for advice, their their you know, their first inclination, I think, is just to say, you don't need my advice. You know, just uh, uh, do what you think. Hmm. And, uh, and then you, you sort of have to push them a little bit, which is actually a really nice thing about the court. Hmm. And do you have a, a, apart from your colleagues now, do you have a Supreme Court justice in the past you think of as a role model? Well, uh, you know, the, 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 the one who's on my wall is Thurgood Marshall mm -hmm. because of my personal connection with Thurgood Marshall, and that's, that's really important to me. Um, I mean, I, I, you know, I'm a huge Justice Brandeis fan. Hmm. Uh, I think he was like the greatest writer ever to serve on the Supreme Court, and uh, and I think he was a very deeply wise human being. Uh, I, I love the way Justice Jackson writes, and I I loved uh, I love his sort of very uh, 
uh, practical and commonsensical and institutional approach to law. So I guess those are my two favorites, Brandeis and Jackson. Those are, those are two good role models, right? And those are great role models. Yeah. Those are great role models. So I think we're, we're running out of time. Um, two final questions. Um, is there anything that, uh, that you didn't know when you graduated from law school that you wish you had known? It's a big question. That's I'll, a big I'll, question. I'll give a little patter while you're thinking about the well, answer. Well, what's your that. answer to that? That's. <laughs> I think the teamwork point teamwork is, actually, is huge. You know, because yeah. I think uh, when I graduated from law school, I thought, you know, that it was all about how smart you were. Yeah. And I thought that it was really about doing it yourself. And so um, I think that's one thing I've learned over the years. Yeah, that it's it's. I mean, you know, it helps to be smart and all that, but uh, but that it is so much about how you get along with people. It's a, it's it's it's. It's so much about your emotional intelligence as well as, you know, it's the EQ as, mm -hmm. as, as opposed to the IQ. Uh, and, and that's true in, in pretty much every single job. I mean, even the ones that you think of as, uh, as more about brilliance than about anything else. It turns out that that's not what they're about at all. That it's, uh, that it's in large part about uh, uh, how well you listen to people, how well you work with people, how well you cooperate with people, how much uh, uh, you can just sort of put your energies together with theirs to do something that neither could have done on your own. And then the final question, as people are getting ready to graduate, is there one piece of advice that you would give them as they start their legal career? Can I say again, like, what's your piece of advice? <laughs> and then I'll just agree with it again. <laughs> I mean, I think, you know, to go back to what you said earlier, being open to opportunity, uh, so, you know, I would say, I mean, one thing that I think it's important and that we always stress in career planning is to have some goals about you know, what's important for you in your career. You know, uh, you know, is public service important to you? You know, what are the things that, that you want to achieve during the course of your career? And, you know, and keep those in mind, uh, but at the same time, life isn't planned. You know, things happen that you can't anticipate. And I think it's, it's very important to be open to them uh, and you know, not to think that the job that you have at 28 is the job that you're going to retire from. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's almost certainly not. And uh, I mean, it's especially now, but in the way the, the legal profession has changed. But I think for, for many, many decades, uh, that in, in, it's one of the great things about a, a lawyer's career is that you can move from one thing to another and that you can experience a lot of different kinds of work in your life. And the ability to recognize that life is long and that there are lots of different opportunities that are going to present themselves to you and that um, uh, you know, gives you a sort of freedom uh, to, 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 to think about your career. And, uh, and I guess the other thing is that in thinking about that, I mean, just to reflect on, and this too changes over the course of somebody's life, but to reflect on, you know, what fills you with a sense of meaning and purpose and value, right? That that I, I think mostly, the lawyers who are happy are lawyers who find some way to accomplish uh, uh, something for people outside themselves, and what that is is going to vary enormously from person to person to person. But to think about you know, the kind of work that you do that because of the way it makes a difference in the world is going to fill you with a sense of you know, mission accomplished during that day, you know, some feeling that you did something that mattered to somebody or, or, or something that you cared about is, uh, is, I think, pretty much the most important thing in, in, in making people really happy to go to work every day. Well, that's terrific. That's a fabulous way to, to end. Um, I actually have, let's see, uh, after the microphone gambit, I think I've gone okay since then, so <laughs> this is my last thing. I'm going to give you some, a tchotchke, which I hope will not drop on the way, but, um, you know, this is something that, um, you know, as people are really about to embark on, you know, a great journey as lawyers, uh, and you'll have incredible opportunities. And I think the opportunity to sit down and to hear from someone who's had the kind of career that you've had, Justice Kagan, and done so many different things, and also to go back to your last point, given back in so many
profound ways and, and really made this world such a better place. It's a real privilege for all of us. So I'd like to present you with this plaque as our first Dean's Inaugural Lecturer to the graduating class. And I'd like to thank you for being here. And I'd like to lead everyone in a round of applause for Justice Elena Kagan. Thank you, Thank Dean. you so much. Thank you.